Hello everyone, this is the Vintage Sewing Machine Garage bringing you a video on a machine brand that you don't see me talking about very often. This of course is the FOF 1196 model that you are looking at. Uh, and the sewing machine, this sewing machine was built um, in the late 60s, early 70s. Now sometimes when you see a sewing machine you think, oh, okay it's a FAF. This one was weighed, made in West Germany. So we know that it was made before the fall of the Iron Curtain. Uh, and <clears throat> FOFs have a great reputation for being strong sewing machines. They have a lot of power. And, uh, but then they also, being a European brand, have a few things you want to consider before you buy one. Now this machine uh, belongs to a client. This one is not for, for sale. <laughs> this doesn't belong to me. Uh, I recently overhauled it for someone. And I wanted to share with you all uh, some of the amazing things about this machine and also something generally to look for uh, because I, uh, in addition to going through the entire machine, reconditioning it, I also had to make some repairs and I wanted to talk to you about why you want to know that before you buy a sewing machine. Okay, uh, so what you're looking at is this is of course uh, a machine that comes with a number of features and you can just tell by the dial here. I'm going to zoom in in a moment. You'll see it. But first I want to go up top. I want to show you. We're going to sort of elevate here a little bit with the camera and I'm going to show you what <laughs> some of the nice features that were introduced uh, onto sewing machines. Some of those that came after the old days of straight stitch sewing. I'm going to zoom in and you'll see here there are a series of buttons on top of the machine. And the FAFs had a long tradition of when they had decorative stitch capability, there were often these little keys, and I like to think of them as like old typewriter keys. And the system works very well as long as you store it properly. Now, fortunately, this machine had gone into storage. It may have been there 20 years, I'm not sure, but it was stored in climate control. Okay, and that was a quite the first question I asked the person who owns this is, can you tell me if it was climate controlled? Because that's going to make a huge difference. Uh, as to how long it's going to take to overhaul and service the machine. Um, the, the last FOF that I worked on uh, had been stored in an attic for 20 years. It was a magnificent machine. It took me three weeks just to get it moving. It was a lot of labor. Okay, So remember, the fact that a machine has uh, multi-stitch capability, lots of uh, options beyond an old straight stitcher, it also makes it more complex to get moving again if it has not been treated kindly over, over the years. But this one was, uh, very fortunately. Now, uh, let's see, it uses, uh, this particular machine uses the M-class bobbins. Any of you who have Viking uh, Husqvarna machines, they're called Vikings in the US, and Husqvarna's in Canada, you will have bobbins like this. Um, if you look at it, you say, gosh, I don't know, is that a strange bobbin? Can I get these? You can get these very easily. Uh, the, I always re recommend people use vintage metal bobbins for these older machines. Uh, these bobbins are not hard to find and you shouldn't have to pay a lot for them. So don't let that scare you off if you're seeing a European machine and you don't recognize uh, the bobbin as one of the more common that Singer invented that so many other companies used, like the Class 15 and the Class 66. Okay, so um, one of the other things I wanted to mention to you is if you're going to have a, let's say you're going to use one of these specialty stitches, um, which I was using, I was using it to test the machine before completing it, you always want to know how these things operate. It's very easy to think, oh, oh, you just push this button and I'll figure it out. But be careful, okay? So let's say I decide I want a blind stitch, right? So I push this button down and there's a series of uh, mechanisms underneath the cover here, which is thankfully removable. I was able to get in there and, and get, to, uh, get to service the machine. But once this uh, button is engaged, it will sew blind stitch. You think, oh, okay, I'm going to push it to make it bounce up, but it doesn't, right? Because this is a release button right here, and it doesn't say that on the machine. So any of you, whether you are brand new to sewing or if you've been sewing all of your lives, if you have a machine that's new to you and you don't kind of recognize the way the way its uh, controls work, take time to read the manual. It can save you a world of time. And again, watch when I press the release, she comes up. So the machine's functioning, and I've, I've mentioned this on some of the old uh, Singer 400 slant series. The more knobs and dials you've got, you really need to take time to study how they work. And again, 
Um, this machine was very stiff when I got it. Oops, that was me. Uh, Let's zoom back out. The machine was very stiff because it hadn't uh, it hadn't been used in about 20 years, and so I, I opened it up and I got uh, I did not just plug it in to to test it at first. The first thing I did was I took and I started getting oil in all of the parts that required it, both underneath and above. And fortunately, none of these these uh, specialty stitch keys were stuck. They were just slow because they they were starving uh, for lubrication. And I did that, right? And then I started manually turning the hand wheel, getting things moving, uh, testing things, you know, like it's light bulb, which works. And I was really, um, really taking time to assess where this machine was. And it slowly came back to life. And now she sews beautifully. Um, uh, let's see, what else? Oh, but that's, the machine itself is not the only thing you test when you're uh, you're checking out, you want to inspect when you buy something, okay? So I want to talk to you guys a little bit about what I found. I had to replace some things, and there were some things I did not have to replace, thankfully. Um, the first one, and I'm going to unplug it so I can pull this up and show you guys, is the cord. Now, if you ever go onto the internet and you think, oh gosh, or maybe you go to your local, local sewing vacuum center, uh, you say, gosh, you know what? The cord is old and it's got problems. It's not safe. I need to get a new cord. You can get a new cord for these, but you will pay a lot more than you would for something like a Singer or a White or a Kenmore. And you think, well, why is that? What's wrong? Well, you know, why are they doing that? That's because fewer of these machines were sold. Pfaff is a well-known brand, as is Bernina, as is Husqvarna, but none of these machines had the same sales figures as Singer and the Kenmore brand at Sears, which was, was once upon a time an amazingly strong brand. And so uh, they make reproductions of the cord you see me holding in, in my hand, but you will pay sometimes six and eight times as much. I went on to, uh, you can just go online. I looked, I was finding if you needed a new pedal, which this machine also did, and I'll talk about that in a moment, um, a pedal and a Foff cord together were anywhere from $100 to $140 before shipping. <laughs> now, the good news is you can get one, but the thing is, you know, wow, really? For a cord? Oh, yes. But the same thing in a singer could be had for, oh, God, a third of that or a fourth of that, you know. Uh, about 30% of that big figure I just gave you, you can get a brand new singer and pedal. Um, or you can buy them separately and wire them if you choose. Now, a couple of things to note. When you're looking at the cord, let's say pretend you're, you're kind of looking at this machine and you're going to buy it from someone. When you're looking at the cords, look at the plug. Okay, because the plug is made of a hard plastic of some sort. Check it for cracks, okay? Make sure that there aren't any cracks. If there's a set screw of any kind, make sure it's there. You know, it's not missing a screw, it's gonna fall apart. And then you can actually go, and in this case, I've already done this, you can plug it in and make sure that it fits snugly. It doesn't wanna slip off, right? So uh, anyway, the client who owns this machine, I, I told him, I said, the good news is your cord is in great shape. Uh, the European companies were the first to do this. They started using a different material. I don't think this is pure silicone because you can't use that uh, with uh, around metal wires, um, but it may have some silicone in it. Regardless, it's a different material than the old rubber or vinyl uh, cord coverings, and it really is uh, has proven itself to be quite durable. You still want to go along, check for any any uh, you know cuts or abrasions that you might have to repair. Now. Uh, the other thing, of course, is the foot pedal. Now, the foot pedal uh, for this machine, this particular one, this machine does not have a proprietary pedal. It did, but it was one of the last FOFs to have. And I'll show you the top side first, and then I'll show you why we had to replace it. This was the top. Whoops, you can see it. don't know if you guys could see a giant, a giant dust bunny just flew out. <laughs> Let me, uh, I'm going to lower this down, guys, so you can get a better view of what I'm what I'm doing down here. So <laughs> this is a giant double weight of dust that fell out of the pedal. I haven't cleaned the pedal out because we're not going to use it. But again, this was the top cover of the foot pedal, right? Notice it has louvers that are open. And that's, a that's one clue that this, this foot pedal needed to have some cooling, some air circulation. And of course, you would press down on, a, on the, the little uh, brown part here, and there's a spring under it. When I turn it upside down, you'll see the spring. Now, when I first got this machine, uh, I 
I got it from the client and I took the foot pedal uh, before I took it apart and I was shaking it, all right, just gently shaking it and I heard a rattle. And I thought, uh oh, that's not good. I didn't know what was inside, but I'm glad I do now. So I've told uh, many of you that when you get foot pedals, the old foot pedals, whether they are uh, carbon pile or whether they are a, some form of rheostat, they often almost always have a porcelain housing inside. And because porcelain is heat resistant and it's also an insulator, it's used as an insulator of, uh, of electricity, electric flow. And this is what fell out, <laughs> like, a, like a giant tooth. This is a piece of porcelain. When I got this pedal apart, and I'm gonna show you guys the bottom, okay? This is what the cover was covering, if you will. Whoops, I gotta turn around the other way. Uh, got multiple pieces here, don't want to drop them. So, this is, how, this is how this pedal looked, guys, okay? So I unscrewed the top from the bottom, there were two screws, and this is what I found. Now, <clears throat> take a good look at this. What I found, and I could see where this piece of porcelain, whoops, had broken off, right? And there are two theories as to how this happened. If it's a Singer pedal, the porcelain housing is a much bigger, thicker chunk of porcelain. You guys may have seen that when I've shown the inside of, a, I think I've done that on the Singer button style. This pedal is, uh, this piece of porcelain, rather, broke off from here for one of two reasons. Either the pedal was dropped, and it's very possible that a pedal this old could have been dropped years ago, right? Or it could be from simply wear and tear. Look closely uh, here, and you'll see uh, a screw, and that piece of porcelain used to set right up against the screw. And then there's a second screw here on the left, and notice it's already cracked. The porcelain here hasn't broken off, but it's cracked. So what this tells me is, um, I don't think, based on the dust that I'm seeing, I don't think this foot pedal was ever open. I think it's been closed since it left the factory in Germany. But what I do believe is that this porcelain piece, when someone was sewing for a while, particularly slowly, uh, this unit got warm, and it was supposed to. That's how it was designed. But when porcelain and steel get warm together and they flex and contract, or expand and contract, at different rates, you eventually get a fatigue and the porcelain gave way, right? So I'm glad we're re we are replacing this because it either would have stopped working or it could have been an electrical uh, issue or failure and you don't want that. And this is the reason why when you've got old foot pedals, it's really helpful uh, if, if you can get them open to look inside, right? Now, a lot of people don't do this and if I hadn't heard the rattle, I think it probably would have been fine, but I like to know. And this little piece here is a capacitor. This is not an electronic foot pedal because it's, it's an analog pedal. It's using analog uh, forms in order to uh, control the flow of electricity. This is here because this is not unlike the capacitors that the, the old Singer pedals would sometimes have. Remember, uh, it used to be that sewing machines could interfere with the reception on, on a television or a radio because, uh, because of the way uh, household electrical current used to be regulated. So uh, they would put these little capacitors in here to help quiet that down. But uh, that's not really an issue today <laughs> because of the way our televisions are made. Those of you who still have televisions, many of you do. But I wanted to show you all this because <clears throat> um, now I might never have heard a rattle. This piece could have been, as you can see, this, this, this area here is cracked, but it's not broken yet, right? So if possible, if there's a way to look inside the foot pedal, you may not be able to do that when you're buying something. I don't know if any seller is going to be patient to give you the time to sit down and do all that. Maybe they don't want you doing that to their machine until you've bought it. But again, if, if, you're, if you have any doubt, see if there's a way to inspect it without damaging the pedal, right? If you can't get it open without damaging it, then you have to make your own decision from there. But I like to err on the side of caution. So I've got the little piece here for the client when they come to get the machine. And uh, I'm glad we did this because this machine, it is not electronic, it is easy. I did not have to go with a Foth pedal. Sometimes when you have electronic controls on things, you, you cannot always go with a generic, or you certainly can't go with a, a, you know, just a two-wire core generic pedal, but that's what this is. This is a, has a 1.2 amp uh, capacity, uh, main time one. Uh, this pedal, and just a reminder you guys, when you have electronic pedals, you also have to be careful with them. 
if they get dropped, they can also be damaged. And it, when that happens, excuse me, very often they just won't work uh, because they don't get really, 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 really warm the way the old style ones do. So anyway, this machine has, fortunately, we kept the old cord and we have the new replacement pedal. And that's what, that's what I'm going to use. And I'm going to show you folks how she sews. Uh, like many European brands, the, the Husqvarna's and the Bernina's, when they are running, they are wonderful. Many of you are very loyal to your Fofs and or some of those other European brands, and I know why. But again, um, getting parts for them and restoring them, they take longer to overhaul. This, this Getting this machine ready took me uh, quite, a, quite a lot more time than does a straight stitch singer. Um, but... Uh, they do have their advantages, and I will I will grant you that. So let's see here. I'll see if we can get her to show off for you a bit. I'll start slowly. I want to make sure that seam goes under the foot. And she, of course, has back tack. I really like the way the back tack on this particular machine works. And then I'll come over here and we'll do another row of, um, I've already tested the machine for its stitches because it's ready, but I've, I'm going to go ahead and do another row of zigzag for you guys. If I can find any room on this little test sample here. Um, and of course the dial, I promised you guys I would zoom in on the dial. So when, woo, when we zoom in, <clears throat> and again, this is another reason why you want to check your manual, right? I waited until I got the machine lubricated and checked everything out before I started turning the dial, and the dial turns beautifully. So you'll notice that this middle dial, there are two dials going on here, right? And it can turn in different ways. This uh, has a way of, um, this is the setting when you want to change your needle position. Let's get the needle up above the fabric there, and we can go to the left, but I'm going to keep it centered. Um, and then the bottom half of this uh, inner dial is for when you're going to do buttonhole sewing. Now, uh, up top, you will see uh, the white, the little white uh, square is kind of your, kind of your indicator of where you are. Here, this is straight stitching. So one through four is straight stitch, and when you get to four, you have your longest stitch, which I think I had it on before I started here. If I decide I want to do zigzag, I can come here, and you'll feel a little piece on the inside turning and I can go all the way until I get to eight. I think that's where I'll go. I'm going to go up to eight and I'm going to do a wide zigzag for you guys. Um, now I should oops, pan back out so you can actually see the machine doing the stitching. <clears throat> and then I'll, I'll pick up these. I've got a bunch of samples I can show you all. Okay, so let's see what she does when she zigzags. And again, I can turn the fabric a bit there. I can go slow or I can go fast, faster. It's funny, uh, the, the sounds machines make, even though this machine is a lot newer than the, I think it was a three, th was it? Not a 392. I had an old gray and white Foff that I did a, one of my earliest videos on. I have to go back and see what the model number was. Uh, and it's funny because even though this is a later design, I don't know if it's the motor or the way they work, but it sounds like a Foff. You know, certain brands have a certain signature sound they make. So I'm going to show you guys what I've got here. Um, this is, you can see the beautiful uh, straight stitch that I did, right? You can see, I think I just did it right here. This was the most recent. So there's a straight stitch and then another zigzag. And you can see my, my new zigzag, I came down and then I kind of crossed over my straight there. Then you can see the other side and you see this magenta colored thread and uh, just a wonderfully balanced stitch. Again, uh, the machine required a little bit of adjustment to its tension, that's not unusual. I have no idea what kind of fabric the, the sewer was using the last time it was used. And here I even tested it on heavier stuff. So here are, uh, you see white, straight, and zigzag stitches. And guys, this is through one, two, oh God, what have I got here? One, two, I've got two, th two lightweight, 
to medium heavyweight. That's four layers. Uh, and I went over a pocket, you know, and again, look at the beautiful tension she shows off even when being asked to do something like this. So again, uh, I wanted to show this to you all. I don't get FAFs in that often. Uh, again, just like all the other European brands, they were smaller companies, at least in North America. That might be different for those of you who are in Europe. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot more FAFs in Germany uh, and, and other parts of Europe than there are here in North America. But when I get a chance to work on one, I do, I do admire these machines quite a bit. Um, I just always want to tell potential uh, buyers, when you're looking for a vintage Pfaff or a Bernina or a Husqvarna, you want to, you want to know that uh, your inspection of the machine, as best you can perform when you're out to buy one, um, you know, you can have things wrong with any machine. Singers, you know, often need work just as much as these do. But the, again, the difference is how easily can you find a part and what will it cost to get that part and then to get the service because it, the service on these European machines takes me longer. But uh, many of you think that they're worth it and I can see why. Thanks for watching everyone and stay tuned for more videos to come.